we want each and every one of the inductees to know they're being selected because of their accomplishments in their lives and because we respect it and because they deserve every bit of admiration that this Hall of Fame involves. We're extremely proud of our accomplishments and I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about BJHI and why it's important. Before we got started, nobody had thought to document Brooklyn and Jewish, those two words, and what the contribution of Jews from Brooklyn was to greater society. And when you think about it, Brooklyn has more Jews than Tel Aviv. Or depending on the year, it could be, it could be plus or minus a few, but we're pretty much neck and neck year after year after year. And when you think about Brooklyn, you think about ethnicities. You think about Jewish people coming from literally all over the world. And we've contributed Nobel Peace Prize winners. We've contributed um, Supreme Court justices, scientists, artists, people in drama, people in the arts, in entertainment, singers, um, poets. You name it, there isn't a profession that a Brooklyn Jewish person hasn't contributed to broader society. And we were the organization that started to put all that together because before we started to do that, nobody was putting it together that Brooklyn and Jewish actually meant something. The building that you're in today is, uh, was, was built in 1881. It was originally the Long Island Historical Society. Uh, and really, this is an institution that has committed itself to looking deeply into the stories that make up Brooklyn going 400 years back. Uh, and those stories are complex. Those are stories about immigrants and laborers and people who have invented themselves and reinvented themselves and been given opportunities that are quintessentially American. At the same time, uh, it is really important to us to understand how much everything we do, uh, whether we're Jewish communities or Muslim communities or African American communities or some of each, uh, that our stories are a mix, are a serious mix of uh, the ways that we face the challenges in our lives, and sometimes that's in our personal lives and sometimes in our lives as whole groups of people, as institutions, uh, as businesses, as all kinds of manifestations of what it means to really be part of this great and amazing borough of Brooklyn. Here's the thing, and I really believe it. In the 5,000 year history of our people, there's never been, we're in the top five, let's say, of Jewish communities truly in, in that history. What we've created in New York, and too often we don't pay attention to it, it has to do with freedom, it has to do with the talent of our people and the vitality of the people, and let nobody say that we're headed anywhere but up. I think it's, it's really important that the New York City Council um, uh, continue to support this initiative um, so that we can uh, capture for posterity uh, the contributions of, uh, of, of Jewish um, uh, people in Brooklyn, also to, to capture uh, you know, this, this, uh, this place in time. Um, uh, the 20th century in Brooklyn and, and onward uh, is an important chapter in the history of the Jewish people uh, here in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, it is in large part um, uh, the American Jewish experience, and I was just looking at, there was an article a few months ago uh, that came out that uh, it said on one or a couple of blocks, I, I believe probably in, in uh, either in David's district or in our old district or Heim Deutsch's district, uh, Jackie Mason, Alan Dershowitz, Sandy Koufax, and Elliot Gould all grew up at the same, at the same time. Um, you know, and, and, and that's just this, you know, this wide diversity of, of contributions of, of uh, Americans. You think of, you know, you think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and uh, just the, the kind of amazing array of, of, of uh, perspectives uh, and identities. 
uh, that uh, the Brooklyn Jewish experience produced. I'm so glad that the City Council has been um, uh, a force in uh, uh, this organization. I, of course, want to thank my good friend Deborah Schwartz as well, who does an amazing, an amazing job for everyone in Brooklyn and really history in the country. I bring you greetings from the villages of South Greenfield and Greenfield uh, tonight to, uh, to welcome uh, this incredible class of inductees uh, that uh, uh, all have contributed to Brooklyn in many ways. Thank you for having me. I'm proud to support this work and I'm grateful for everybody here tonight for everything that you do. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into the Hall of Fame portion of the evening. And I'm going to start with introducing Rita Schwartz. She is going to be inducting in Mimi Sheraton in Absentia. For those of us of a certain generation or uh, upbringing, um, Mimi Solomon, or Sheridan as she's now known, or Mimi Falcone as she's also known, um, she, when I, when I I first read her cookbook from my mother's kitchen. I said, no, no, this is from my mother's kitchen. And it's probably from everybody's mother's kitchen because it has things in it like ribboners, like um, newspapers on the floor on Shabbos. So you don't get the floor dirty, of course, and you might trip on it. Like borscht, like how to make better matzo balls than somebody else, like the dried out meat and canned foods and anybody else have other wonderful food memories like mine? <laughs> uh, but but that, was, that, was, that was what I got from early years ago, getting Mimi's first book. Uh, when, when we asked her to come, she was also going to come, and then she said to me, I'm getting old. She's 93 now, um, and she's not feeling well. She's frail. So she wrote some words that I've been thrilled to read for you. First, many thanks for the high honor and my apologies for not being able to be there to accept in person. Age takes a toll. But it is especially fitting that I received this from the Brooklyn Jewish Historical Society as it was that combination of having been brought up Jewish in Brooklyn that awakened my interest in food. Although in no way observant of Ashruth, my mother prepared many Ashkenazi dishes. She was, seems to have been a combination of Polish Hungarian, uh, Austrian, Austrian, and some German mixed in in, in her family. Um, along with some purely American food, and my father was in the wholesale fruit and produce b b business in New York's Washington Market. So there was lots of talk of food at home related both to preparation and ingredients. The first sentence of her book says, so stop measuring and start cooking, which sort of struck me as I think I heard my mother's voice. In addition, my parents loved to eat out and took me along to many Brooklyn restaurants, mostly bygone. The first restaurant I recall was the original Lundy's. Everybody's been to Lundy's, right? When it was first built on a pier jutting into Sheepshead Bay, long before it regrouped on Emmons Avenue. There were also many forays into lo lo local kosher delis and Cantonese restaurants in the Midwood section of Flatbush. Those are all now kosher Cantonese restaurants, I think. Later, I developed a critical tendency towards lunches in the cafeteria of Midwood High School, my much-loved alma mater. I hungrily recalled the great Coney Island hot dogs at Nathan's and Feltman's and the wonderful hot peanuts sold at Ebbets Field during Dodger games, especially on Ladies' Day. I was recently disappointed with awful peanuts at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> so chuck, chuck one, one more up for Brooklyn. And so these are some of the Brooklyn Jewish food memories along with fond memories of everything else. Many thanks to all again and I congratulate my fellow honorees on this very special evening, Mimi Sheraton Falcone. Is it David you've been in politics all these years you're the only person I know that nobody ever says bad things about I don't know, you should ask that Steve Levin and Colin Yeager I'm sure they can give you uh, <laughs> a list I, I, I like to think everyone has their own sort of shtick my shtick is that uh, I'm I'm a straight shooter I tell it like I see it I think that 
both Steve and Common can vouch for me on, a, on that level. And uh, that's for better and for worse, right? Some people like that, some people don't. The good news is that when you meet with me or talk with me, you always know where you stand. I think most people appreciate that, right? It's pretty rare, I would say, in the business of politics or law or administration that I'm in right now to find someone who just sort of tells you what is really on their mind. Where'd that come from? Is that from your upbringing? Is that Brooklyn? Is that just you and yeah, nobody I mean, else I don't, who you I don't know, know is that how way? You could, what? How, could, how could you grow up in Brooklyn and uh, not be a straight shooter, right? That's a Brooklyn quality, right? You know, if you want to know what's on someone's mind, just, you know, walk down the streets of Ocean Parkway and say, you know, good Shabbos. And the guy's like, it's a terrible Shabbos. I don't know what you're talking about. You're like, okay, I'm just being polite, buddy. Relax. But um, it's never happened to any of you. Maybe as an elected official. But the point that I'm saying is that um, I think that is unique to the Brooklyn experience. I think Brooklynites, we tell you what's on our mind for better or for worse. And uh, that can get salty sometimes, but uh, not in this kind of form, obviously. But I think that's um, a, a good advantage of being from Brooklyn. Now, you went far beyond that. You were head of the Jewish caucus when you were in the council and really took a look at, at citywide. And of course, now you're in one of the most important positions, candidly, uh, in terms of Met Council on Jewish Poverty, uh, which it takes care of so many needy in New York. And many people don't even understand the, the, the latitude of that. Um, tell, tell us sure. about what this new position means to you. Yeah, I, you know, there's a million and a half Jews who live in the New York area. There's around 500,000 who are living in poverty. It's a pretty shocking statistic when people hear that. I, I think that really when we look at the demographics and we break it down, there's three large populations. Seniors, thank God people are living longer than ever. Unfortunately, many people were not able to plan and just simply ran out of money. And so now we need to, be, we need to help people who have really built our city, right? And then I would say immigrants. We have a tradition of welcoming immigrants. We still have immigrants that are coming in every day. We have from France and South America, especially with the crisis in Venezuela. We're seeing a lot of immigrants that are still coming. And we're still, 30 years later, we're still helping a lot of the immigrants from the former uh, Russian uh, countries that are, are still struggling, and that's our responsibility. And then we see uh, certainly a large need within the ultra-Orthodox community as well. And so th those are the three largest segments that we really are working on and that we're constantly serving in our communities. And, and one of the interesting parts to me, looking at you, David, um, not only have you been a mentor to many people, um, but you're a model to many people in terms of how they look at you and, and, and the way you conduct yourself. Um, what would you say in terms of the, the, the tone of the time that Brooklyn and, and, and the way you've been um, really becomes a, as, as part of what this Jewish Hall of Fame is? You know, it's, it's people to look up to. And we really need people to look up to, you being one of them. What, what well, does that for, all mean Well, first of all, today? it's an honor to be on the stage with such amazing honorees. I think everyone has a unique story. I encourage everyone to read about everyone's story and the work that they've done and their respective professions. I think it's uh, pretty incredible, so thank you all. And I'm privileged to be part of such an amazing group. I think that, you know, the, the real story for me about Brooklyn is the idea that it's very egalitarian, right? I think if you ask most people on the stage here, uh, very, very few of us uh, had were grown up with a silver spoon in our mouth, and we didn't have uh, privilege growing up, but we scrabbled and we worked hard and we persevered. I think everyone's nodding along because that's the <laughs> Brooklyn story, right? And uh, we succeeded in our respective professions because that's what Brooklyn, I think, allows you to do. I think it's the diversity. It's the adversity, quite frankly. Brooklyn's not an easy place to grow up or to live, and somehow you make it work as well. And I think that's what makes it so unique. And I think the message that I would certainly uh, transmit now that the beeping sound has gone off and I'm out of time is that, <laughs> is that anybody watching this, whether it's on television or in the audience, should recognize that really you have every opportunity conceivable in Brooklyn. And if you work hard with a little bit of uh, good old fashioned mazel, as we say, a little bit of luck, you can really accomplish anything. And you don't have to believe me, just look at the amazing honorees that we have up here tonight and the incredible things that they have accomplished. Well, we're, we're thrilled you're part of the class of 18. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I've known Rabbi Kess, I believe, 36 years. Um, the same amount of time that you were rabbi at the East Maybe Jewish Center. Correct. Now, you must be doing something right. 
<laughs> that they would keep a rabbi for 36 years, all right? They'd tie him up and hold, hold on to him. That's because I'm in the same field as David, politics. <laughs> <laughs> but longevity seems to be in your makeup because uh, since 1966, that's I believe 52 years if I did my math right, you have been the chaplain for the New York City Police Department. Nineteen, I mean, way back in the last century. <laughs> um, the longest serving chaplain in, in the, the police department's history. In fact, you served under um, seven mayors and 16 police commissioners. Boy, I bet you got stories to tell. <laughs> Do you, uh, can you elicit on maybe one of them? Well, I, I'm delighted, first of all, to be here. And uh, I have to tell you, as a rabbi, I think I'm the luckiest person in the world because I'm in a position where I can really enjoy people at their best. I can intensify their joy. I try to help them through sorrow. But the greatest pleasure of a rabbi, and the word rabbi means teacher, is to see your offspring achieve great things. And I'm on the bill here tonight with Adam Richman. He's my student, my, my bar mitzvah boy. And uh, it's... I had to work a lifetime to get some sort of recognition. He's just a kid. But the Talmud says there are those who are kone et olamo b'sha'a achat. You can acquire your redemptive quality and your salvation in an instant. And it's uh, just a joy to see a young person do that. Uh, the career that I have had has had high points. It's had very sad points. I was at Madison Square Garden this morning for police graduation, and I had to give a prayer for a firefighter uh, who last night fell three stories in, uh, in the Bronx uh, fighting a fire, and uh, we're praying for his survival. I'm sure you all join me in that prayer. And in the life of my family, we've had uh, uh, certainly uh, adversities. As uh, my daughter, who is here with me tonight, uh, will remember, my son Danny was bar mitzvah at East Midwood Jewish Center, and like all fathers, I was very proud of him. He davened Shachras and Musaf and read the Torah and the Haftorah. I wasn't uh, in the house five minutes after it was all over, and I got a call that a Jewish police officer in Far Rockaway had been shot, and I was asked to respond. I, when I got there, he was already dead, and I spent uh, the next three days uh, trying to help his family wrestle with all of this and make funeral arrangements. This coming Friday, I'm going to be back here in Brooklyn at the East Midwood Jewish Center for a memorial service for a Jewish cop whose mother davens every week at, at East Midwood now by the name of Joe Galapo, uh, who died some years ago. And uh, these are experiences that uh, take a part of your life away, but the life that is taken away from you, you have an opportunity to give to somebody else who has uh, suffered terrible loss. And uh, that chance to intensify the life of people in good times and also to help them in bad times, I think is the greatest privilege of the, in the world. And it's been my opportunity to be able to do that for my entire adult life and I'm very thankful. Hank uh, serves on the boards of Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation Board of Directors with me, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation uh, Board of Directors, the St. Anne's Warehouse Board of Directors, and the Brooklyn Public Library Board of Directors. He's also uh, the chair of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, which is uh, really at the vanguard of economic development in the entire country. Um, Hank is one of the most civically minded people uh, I've ever had the pleasure of, of working with. So my first question for you, Hank. Yeah. Um, how, has, uh, how have the Jewish values that you were raised with informed uh, your public service? 
the values uh, I learned from my parents. It's very simple, and they learned them from theirs, that, uh, uh, that we have an obligation, if, if we can, to give back to the community. And uh, uh, I've been very fortunate in that I've had some, some wonderful opportunities to do that, and I've tried to do the best with them. But again, it's, uh, I learned it where, where most of us, I'm sure, learned our values, from our parents and from their parents, and it's all part of all part of the tradition that, that uh, I've always identified as Jewish. Um, so all of these amazing uh, Brooklyn institutions that you've been a part of, um, how do you, where do you place the value of institutions uh, in, uh, uh, in the kind of bigger picture of Brooklyn and the bigger picture of New York City as a whole? I actually, I think that the, the, the value and strength of an institution depends on the people. And, and you know, their, their adherence to whatever the mission is, their commitment to getting it done, their vision, their ability to imagine things that don't yet exist, uh, to stick, stick with them through difficult times and challenges. And heavens knows on the park, we've been through, we've been through a bunch of those together. Um, so, you know, I think the institutions are important, important, but they're only as strong as the people uh, who keep them going and pass them on from generation to generation. Um, and this might be a, a, an unusual question at a historical uh, event, but uh, you're a big believer in the future of Brooklyn. Uh, where do you see the future going in our borough? No, absolutely, and, uh, and I should I should confess, I probably should have said this at the outset, I mean, one of the, one of the many reasons I'm not sure I feel qualified to be up here is that I'm a convert, not to Judaism, but to Brooklyn. Uh, I, was, I was asked before we began what high school I went to, and, and I was ready to name the high school in New Jersey, and I was told that didn't count, so. Uh, uh, I'm from New Jersey, too. There you go, yeah. okay. So, uh, no, I've, I've been here since, since 1975, raised my family here. Uh, my first job after law school was clerking in the federal court at Cadman Plaza, and then I worked on Wall Street, and it was the world's second easiest commute. Uh, my wife and I fell in love with the community, fell in love with the neighborhood, fell in love with the views, fell in love with the people, fell in love with the fact that it wasn't Manhattan and that we revel in our diversity in Brooklyn and cherish it. And um, Brooklyn got cool despite us. It's now the center of the universe. I think its, I think it's future is, is bright as can be and, and unlimited. Every, every time I go to a college reunion, a law school reunion, I meet classmates, including a law school classmate who was the governor of Mississippi. And, and when we talk about, oh, gee, are you ever going to be in New York? Are you going to be in Brooklyn? Give me a call. Every single one, I've got a daughter who lives in Brooklyn. I've got a son who lives in Brooklyn. All the talented young people from all over the country want to live here. So, so I think the future is, is incredibly bright. And I'm thrilled we made that choice 40 years ago and 43 years ago. And I uh, wish I could have been born here, but I've tried, tried my best to make up for that deficiency. Um, no, I think, it's, I think it's amazing. And, you know, the park where you and I work together on the board is spectacular. I mean, those were abandoned piers not that long ago. And now it's one of the principal attractions in the city of New York. People come, millions, of five million people came last year from all over the world and all over the city. And again, representing the full diversity. I love watching, I love watching all these diverse people. Uh, enjoying that park, and I mean, one of my one of my favorites, Passover last year, watching watching a a I won't call them a gang, a group of young Orthodox boys racing around on city bikes with the tzitzis flying behind them. They looked like a biker gang, only Brooklyn style. Uh -huh. um, and then and now at the Navy Yard, where you know where where our mission is to take that that old historic Navy facility abandoned by the Navy in the 60s and take those old buildings and turn it into manufacturing, uh, a manufacturing home for now. Our latest count, we've got 8,500 people working there and we're gonna have, I forget whether it's 15,000 or 20,000 by 2020. Um, 
you know, creating, in Washington they talk about creating manufacturing jobs and middle class jobs. Uh, you know, I have the privilege of working with an incredibly talented management team that actually does that mm -hmm. every day for the people in the city who need it the most. So, you know, my parents started me on this path, but I consider myself incredibly lucky to have the chance to, you know, in my own way, participate. It takes a certain kind of person to be able to move up, move on, say there are things that I want to accomplish in life, and to be able to be that role model for so many other women. And in looking at your accomplishments and all of the things that you've done, not just being the first judge, but um, the, the respect to, you know, to, to women, to be able to have an emergency service, to all of the things that you've accomplished really set a role model for women in the Jewish community. And I, 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 I'd like you to expand a little bit on the driving force, um, on how you, you, you were able to accomplish some of those things. What your value system in being able, growing up in Brooklyn, in Borough Park, and how that helped contribute to the role model that you've set for the future of Jewish women here. Thank you. Well, first, let me take my drink of water. Okay. I'll make my bracha baruch atah adonai elohinu melech halam shakol niya bedvarel. And that bracha really encapsulates my, my whole persona, is that everything that happens is because God wants it to happen. And if you, I said, if you want, if you want something to happen, you just really have to work hard and believe that God controls the world and then anything is possible. So I really want to thank my husband and my sons that are sitting here and my mother, my sister, my aunt who are sitting here because Without my support of the family, I couldn't have accomplished anything. So my mother raised us girls, telling us, girls, you could do anything you want to, so long as it isn't illegal, immoral, or against the Torah. So here I was growing up as a Bishak of Grohl and Barapak, knowing that the world is wide with opportunity. I didn't feel constrained. I didn't feel restricted. I knew I had rules, but I knew that I could really go far. And thank God my husband is very supportive very supportive, and that's how I was able to accomplish things, but it's really my faith that God runs the world. And I had so many naysayers all along, the road, all along my path, all along my journey, and I still have them because I'm still on my journey. I haven't finished. And people are always telling me, it's never gonna happen, it's never gonna happen. I'll always say, how do you know it's never gonna happen? If God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm Hasidic. It doesn't matter if I have my restrictions. Because if God wants me to succeed, I'll get there. I think my, my campaign was the most exciting campaign. Borough Park rocked. I mean, you had to see my boys with their long side curls, their long payas, saying, vote for Freya, says my mama. <laughs> and you know what? It worked. So I think that all of us sitting here are all part of something wonderful. We're all the part of the tapestry of, of Judaism, the tapestry that you can only have in Brooklyn. I don't think I could have done what I've done any place other than Brooklyn. So I thank God for that opportunity. How do you find the balance between, um, between your home life and your professional life and I mean, I know, you know, I'm a professional, I'm modern orthodox, and, you know, I'm cooking dinner on Friday for 20, 20 people, and, you know, suddenly people show up, the kids show up, and it's like finding that balance between professional life and doing what you want to do professionally and accomplishing it between the, the tugs that come from your home life and being able to keep that balance and maintain that. I, I so admire your ability to do that. Well, thank you so much. I think it, it's really like, um, we say that it's siyatha dishmaya, it's really divine providence. Just pray a lot and hope that God helps me. I, I was once interviewed by a, um, a talk show host from Israel, and she said to me, she said, Ruchi, you know, you're, you sit in criminal court and you hear about these awful crimes, and how do you go home and you know, leave that in the court? 
And I thought for a moment, I said, you know, Robertson, I think it's the other way around. I bring my home, my background, my values with me. The, the concept of standing up for what's right, belief, emuna, faith, you know, bitachon, all those concepts, if you have them with you, and I thank my teachers from Beis Yaakov growing up. I, I was born in Crown Heights. My parents moved to Bar Park when I was about a year old. And um, I think those values that we grew up with, and luckily I had my grandparents who were Holocaust survivors, and they also always taught us, be so proud that you live in America. Be so proud that you're American because you have opportunities that we didn't have back in, in Hungary. So my mother always told us, go for it. My father also, I mean, my father thought I was a lawyer before I was a lawyer. <laughs> I remember he came, he calls me up when he says, Ruchi, I was in Manhattan, and I bought one of these magazines, the top 50 lawyers in the country. I didn't see your name here. <laughs> but that's it. You know, if you believe in your children and you instill in them that faith and that concept that they could succeed, you can get there. I think that's really my story. Adam, you're a foodie. I'm a foodie. That's why we're married here up here tonight. You're a self-educated food expert. How did your, how did your coming from Brooklyn drive you into that particular area of interest? I think as my fellow Brooklynites, even transplanted ones, would agree. Um, you know, there was the, the, the Brooklyn of Ebbets Field and the Dodgers and trolley cars and the steeplechase, and then there's the Brooklyn of ironic mustaches and white people living in Bushwick. And I grew up <laughs> in that period in between. And as we talked about, it wasn't, it was, sort of your resilience as a Brooklynite that sort of was your bond. But also this notion of the ethnic aisle at the supermarket or ethnic neighborhoods just didn't exist. My, the neighbors across the street were Sicilian. My neighbors to my left on Homecrest Avenue were Syrian. To the right, they were Irish. And our, we'd all play in the playground, and our moms would all share recipes. My father, me, rest in peace, his law office was adjacent to Chinatown. Um, and and always um, instilled in me the, the sort of motto or credo, if you will, of you don't have to finish it, but you should at least try it. And I think that you grew up, I mean, I was born in 74, so there was an undiluted aspect to these cultures, and you can go to Astoria and be immersed in Greek cuisine. You can go to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx and be immersed in Italian cuisine. And I think... Um, I think that that's something that's so special, and then especially if you look at Brooklyn, you know, when it was just truly a melting pot, it, there wasn't this demarcation, you know, maybe a little bit of West Indian communities and Flatbush and Russian communities in Brighton Beach, but that was the beauty of it. And, you know, my best friend could have a last name like Eng, you know, N-G, and, and then another best friend could be African American or Trinidadian American, and, um, you know, all of a sudden you're learning about roti and you're learning about caponata as much as you understand shawarma or kibbe or charosis or something like that. So as you, I had told you before, I'm Syrian. And um, so my ethnic background is Syrian food. My grandmother was a caterer. And you bring, um, I think what happens is, is that today we're seeing a fusion of a lot of different cultures in food. How do you see... Um, your background growing up in Brooklyn and looking at foods, how do, you, how do you see that that meshing with today's fusion that we see in restaurants and all kinds of food and recipes? No, it's an excellent question. Well, I think that, um, you know, we already had someone very knowledgeable even say that I think in Brooklyn, no one really came from silver spoon backgrounds. And there's, a, there's an absence of pretense um, and so this notion of fusion was exactly what my mom was doing at the playground, taking an Italian woman's recipe and reinterpreting through the filter of a Jewish woman who grew up in Marine Park. And I think that there was fusion before there was fusion. You know, I used to go to East Midwood um, to go to school and pass a restaurant called Shanghai. And <laughs> that is in and of itself a kind of fusion. I always say how, you know, 
when you see green bagels on St. Patrick's Day, you immediately sort of see two very different cultures moving at loggerheads, but that's the thing. I really believe that food kind of continues in that, exists within this continuum, and the story never quite ends. So growing up in Brooklyn, especially now with young chefs, really um, creating a great groundswell, giving Brooklyn a true culinary identity, um, restaurants like the Olmstead and Saul and uh, Roberta's in, in uh, Bedstein Bushwick, they're really helping Brooklyn be on the map for something other than two cents plain, the Coney dog. And I'm not insulting any of that stuff. I mean, I'm blessed to have gone to Horn and Art Art and seniors on Nostrand Avenue and Lundy's before it closed. So um, I think that that's the really special thing. We truly are a melting pot here. And if I just say one thing, I noticed that a lot of the people in the audience tonight are around my mom's age or older than myself, but to all the young people here, I just wanted to say um, how important our role is um, with Judaism sort of being both under attack and potentially in decline all around the world, being a Brooklyn Jew. I wear a chain like in the shape of Brooklyn around my neck every day. Uh, but my, my Jewish identity and my Brooklyn Jewish identity is very, very dear to me. So I just hope that all the young people here continue to stay involved with this great organization and continue to make an impact in your communities uh, because we are the future of it. And I, and you know, my dad went to school with Gabe Kaplan and Barbara Streisand and at Erasmus Hall. And hopefully there's another new vanguard of, of Brooklyn Jews to sort of carry the banner. I'm so impressed with the number of women on stage getting COVID, which they richly deserve, and Fern Perlstein is certainly one of them. Although a Brooklynite, for most of my life, I met Fern in South Carolina, <laughs> where nothing could be finer to be at a Jewish humor conference. And I want to begin with a question. How did Jewish humor get to South Carolina? And why did you do the film, which got me in trouble, uh, in a way? I once lectured on Holocaust humor as a measure of survival, and my wife, who was in the stay, was is in the audience. They can testify. They booed me off the stage. Fern Perlstein did a film called The Last Laugh, and she got away with it. Tell us how you did it. How I got away with it? Yeah. Um, well, you know, first of all, I interviewed Mel Brooks. Brooklyn so he, Jew? Brooklyn Jew, who uh, gave me a certain amount of credibility. But really, um, we, we filmed a lot of Jewish comedians, but, but we found a survivor who's now 94, who is the heart and soul of the film, and she, she talks about her experiences in Auschwitz and, and, and her life and how she can find humor. And because it's sort of guided by her voice and her heart, you know, I think that, um, you know, we were able to, you know, open people's eyes. To, like when they hear about the subject, they're upset. Then they see it and they realize that we did it with heart. And as you say, it, it, you know, it's like a form of healing and, and different things like that. How did you find your way to Brooklyn? You were educated in California, the Harvard of the West, Sanford. So what brought you to this wonderful borough? Well, um, my family. So I've, so I've lived in New York since the 80s, but um, when I had a family, we decided to come to Brooklyn. And it was the first, you know, I came from Philadelphia, actually, so I'm also a transplant, and I was in this, lived in this, very, very Jewish community. And I had this sense of community that I never had when I lived in Manhattan. And, and when I moved to Brooklyn, I found that community again. Evidently, Brooklyn has been the scene of quite a number of films. Can you think of any film from Brooklyn, maybe a Woody Allen film or? You see, I'm a documentary filmmaker, so I travel the world, so I've made films you know, I made a, a film following Amelda Marcos, you know, in the Philippines for a couple of months. There I, must have been a lot of shoes in that film. There were a lot of shoes. I got yeah. to try on a pair of her shoes, actually. Yeah. 
you know, I've, I've made a film in Japan about sumo wrestlers. I've made a film about a leprosarium in, in New or outside of New Orleans. It was the last uh, leprosarium in the continental US. So, you know, my filming goes to where the people I'm filming are, you okay. know, so not necessarily I, I, in Brooklyn. I want to mention in closing that you're married to a filmmaker, I a am, writer, who's here. and who's here with a daughter who may be a future filmmaker. And I want to thank <laughs> your family for supporting you, and thank you for coming and honoring us. Thank you. So I'm Whether it was in terms of your dedication uh, as a, in, in your family being Holocaust survivors, um, your Jewishness and your commitment to Jewishness, um, whether it was Amuna, whether it was in terms of Jewish heritage, the videos you've done, your total commitment to Israel, um, it's extraordinary. Where does it all come from? I think it all comes from my parents, okay? I, I do feel that my parents were my inspiration. Um, they both su were survivors, and they both taught me the meaning of courage, perseverance, and living life in spite and despite all their losses, and the losses were great. My mother is and was amazing. She was one of the first authors of Holocaust books when nobody was talking about it and nobody was writing about it, my mother was. And I was a little girl when I watched her write her book. And I participated as a little girl. I even have a poem in her book. And I was very young. And she's, unlike most survivors, she spoke about it all the time to the point where I said, enough. But my father didn't say anything, and that was equally horrible. So one of the things that you've done is written so many songs um, and, and done so many videos. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. Um, I guess that comes from your mother writing all the time that you started doing that. Um, but, but tell us about some of, of what really moves you to do this, and, 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 and I know how much you've done in terms of Israel. Um, so, I have a lot of passion for different causes, for different things. That whatever ignites my passion, that's what I go after. For many years, I was just writing songs, and then I met a wonderful filmmaker, Daniel Finkman, and we started to incorporate the music with videos, which really broadened my scope greatly. I mean, we did a video um, in Poland, in Warsaw recently, it's being finished now. It's called Change the World. I'm trying to make that little statement, let's change the world, end the cries, you know, see each other with clear eyes. Tell, us, tell us quickly, because everything is quick here, yes. um, about the Holocaust Memorial and, and what you had in Brooklyn and what you did in terms of okay. moving it down south. So many years ago, there was a school in Shalamet in Midwood and my children went to that school, and my husband and I dedicated a monument. I actually designed it, and I found a sculptor, Anne Froman, who brought it to life. If you know the poem, The Last Butterfly, by Pavel Friedman, who was a victim in Theresienstadt. He died at 15 years, and he wrote a poem, The Butterfly. So I decided to do a monument in memory of the one and a half million Jewish children. And I hired Ann Froman, and she did an amazing monument. It's a butterfly wrapped in barbed wire, and the poem, The Butterfly, is at the and base. And then it had to be moved. So what happened? Shalamet had to move. I said, what am I going to do with my butterfly? It's such a beautiful butterfly. I want the world to see it. And I literally went shopping. And I, I was shocked. I went from one place to another to another, and my poor butterfly was rejected. And I, I was giving a donation. You know? And then finally accepted. One day, I'm in California, Simon Wiesenthal, the bookshop, and I see paper clips. The story, I don't know if you've seen it, paper clips. And it took, care, took place in Tennessee, and amazing place. And I see that the address of this place is one butterfly lane. 
I give a phone call to the principal, and this is an all Protestant school, and I said, I have a beautiful butterfly I want to donate to you, and she tells me, Protestant lady, this is Bashert. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, Bashert? I can't believe, how do you know the word? She says, I know it, it's Bashert. And I shipped the butterfly to Tennessee, and we had a major dedication in this past September. The mayor came, the whole town came, and we dedicated our beautiful butterfly in one butterfly lane, and it's there for the world to see. From European capitals to, uh, to, to, to Brooklyn, um, all in between Yiddish and English, Broadway, um, that's who you are. Uh, that's part of who I am, and uh, Brooklyn had a substantial uh, role uh, in my life and upbringing. I thought I might be Miss Subway, but instead, really, <laughs> I've been honored here today, and, and I'm delighted to be with all of you and share this honor. Thank you, Howard. Um, my parents were Holocaust survivors. They came to America in 1950 to Brooklyn. I was born 20, 30 years later. And, um, <laughs> oh, it's true. And, uh, and we lived, I was born here, and we lived, I tell people that we were the last white people in every neighborhood that we lived in. <laughs> so we began on Cleveland Street, on Hendrick Street and moved to uh, Ocean Hill Brownsville area, which is where I went to junior high school, to East Flatbush, born in Bethel Hospital, went to Tilden High School, moved further east to 1640 Ocean Avenue, where my first apartment was across the street from the East Midwood Jewish <laughs> Center. <laughs> It's, so it, it seems comes, like that's the center of I the world. I guess so. I guess so. It all comes full circle, um, and uh, through Park Slope, and eventually into Manhattan. But um, one one of the things that really you can lend some information to all of us is you've been to so many of the international Yiddish festivals and other kinds of festivals. Give us a sense of what's going on outside. There's a, there's a resurgence of Yiddish. There is. It's very exciting. Um, thanks to music, thanks to the arts, and I guess because so many who came before us are exiting and have already exited Ergetzandesh uh, gegangen. So uh, there's been a resurgence of interest in Yiddish. And it's spectacular, and it's beautiful, and people are writing new tunes and new poems. Um, I used to be the artistic director of the Folkspina, and you see now that they've done Fiddler in Yiddish. There's so much. There, there is so much going on, and it's... Meken reden Yiddish wie misenen jetzt. You know, there's somebody to talk to, and it's really as the Spanish like to say, a machaya. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you've really been the centerpiece in so many ways in a continuing journey uh, of, of this involvement with the arts. And you've also done Broadway. It's not just the Jewish world. No, it's not just the Jewish world. In general, though, I find that what I am after all these years is a storyteller either as an actor or as a writer or as a singer or as director. And ultimately, either in Yiddish or in English, I'm on the shoulders of my family and the people that came before me who taught me how to be and how not to be and how to be funny and how to fight and how to be scrappy, which is kind of what Brooklyn is. And indeed, the truth, which seems to be also, what Brooklyn stands for is uh, Emmis, really. You, you say what you think. You really do. And, and so we have one minute. And, and so in, in the minute, what I'd like you to do is just give us a sense of 
the vibrancy that all of this has meant to you. You've been involved with so many wonderful people um, and so many wonderful people in the Jewish community over the years. It's really a gift, isn't it? It is. I mean, I began working in the theater uh, you know, for 35 years ago <laughs> when I was just a little baby. <laughs> and my interaction with different talents and different humans of all persuasions, some of the greatest Yiddish actors also who survived the Holocaust and who came to the United States, and I was very young, actually, and worked with them and learned from them and they taught me how to be on the stage, what Yiddish theater meant. And now I work with wonderful artists, Frank London, Zalman Mlotek. Um, I worked with Adrian Cooper. We all work together and have uplifted Yiddish into the contemporary world. And it's modern and groovy, and it's not dusty and stodgy but it has moved into the times, and so it's pretty great. I spoke to Abe Becker a week before he died. He was incredibly delighted at that point, though failing in health. But the Malchamuvis, the angel of death, claimed him on Sunday. He was buried on Tuesday. But we have here very much alive Charlie Rosen. Charlie is a basketball legend at Hunter College, where he was center. At six foot eight, he's very easy to look up to. <laughs> he is a prolific author, and I asked him to come because of his recent book, one of many, uh, called The Chosen Game. Charlie, tell us about the legends of the game with Jewish. Well, uh, basketball was invented in Sp Springfield. I always get the date wrong. 1892? No, 1891. 1891. Okay. But that's all right. One year among friends. By the original Dr. J. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Naismith, uh, just before Christmas, okay. and during the Christmas vacation, all the all the students kind of dispersed, and the game kind of spread. And one of the places it spread to was Brooklyn. Um, and it, it, it kind of, and, and actually the settlement houses uh, around here, uh, specifically the Henry Street settlement house, um, became a hotbed of young Jewish boys, of second generation mostly, playing basketball. Um, and it's, it's uh, astounding how Jews, young Jewish boys, took to the game. It was, it was a new game. Uh, the rules were not very well formulated. And, and these kids, uh, it, it was a way for them to become part of America, to become part of the American culture. And... Um, they just grew up and spread all, all over the country, uh, up to Boston, Philadelphia. But the game that was played down in the Lower East Side was um, the prototypical game. The gyms were small, so the players had to move a lot and cut and pass and fake one way and go the other way. Hubie Brown, a Hall of Fame uh, coach, who coached the Knicks for a while, called the, the basketball that was played on the Lower East Side Jew Ball. And he says that that's the way the game should be played. And he says that, um, for example, for any basketball fans here, San Antonio Spurs played Jew Ball. Um, so, um, Abe Becker was one in a long line of great Jewish basketball players. Uh, he played for NYU uh, in, the, in the 30s, in the 40s, and in the early 50s. 
most of the great Jewish basketball, most of the, uh, of, the, of the college teams in New York, LIU, City College, NYU, um, featured Jewish basketball players. Um, and Jewish basketball players were so proficient that the legendary uh, Wonder Five at St. John's in the, early, in the early 30s, which is certainly not a Jewish school, started four Jewish players. Um, and the Jewish players uh, were admitted to uh, Holy Cross and uh, you know, with various places all over the country. And the greatest Jewish basketball player was Dolph Shays, who I had the pleasure to meet and uh, deal with him, and he was a sweet, sweet man. But to show you how uh, you know, the Jewish players were sometimes considered to be smart and kind of shifty and kind of soft players. Well, Dolph uh, kind of proved the lie to that. At one point during his NBA career with the Syracuse Nationals, he broke his right arm and he played with a cast. So he learned how to shoot left-handed and he used his cast to smash opponents in the face. Uh, <laughs> Amos. <laughs> So um, there is a tradition of great Jewish basketball players. The, uh, unfortunately, the only Jew in the NBA is Omri Caspi, who's um, an Israeli, and I had some uh, contact with him. I interviewed him for the book, uh, The Chosen Game. And he talks about how tough Israeli Jews are and how tough Jews are, and don't take them for granted. Um, that gives the lie to the image that Jews were invertebrate and weak. Jews fought back and basketball became a vehicle for asserting one's dignity and pride. And I thank you for bringing that to the attention of readers, Jewish and non-Jewish, that once there was a game called basketball and it was our game, the game of the chosen. Thank you, Charlie. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.